do you sense that in some way the Christian Holy Bible is also walled off from certain kinds of inquiry, even in American academia? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, there's a huge amount of scholarship on the Bible, uh, but from all kinds of points of view, this so-called higher criticism. It took a while to do it because for a long time you weren't allowed to say, for example, there were different voices. Uh, they now talk about the J and the P, depending on the different word for God. Is it Elohim? Is it Yahweh? And so on. And even the first person who pointed this out lost his job. Uh, it, it was dangerous to do this in even the history of, of uh, Western scholarship. But I think in the 21st century, people are pretty, pretty free to say what they want about the Bible. People are free, are, are, are free to reject it. I found, actually, the best evidence for my own research was going to uh, Christian bookstores. And there were all these books about apparent contradictions in the Bible, seeming inconsistencies. Books and books of these things were because the biblical the Bible scholars noticed that there were th these two different versions: two of every animal on the ark, seven of every animal, and they were trying to work out, you know, what was the real what was the real version. Of course, there is no correct version from a folklorist point of view. So they gave me all the evidence I needed. All I had to do was to look up the so their passages, and I saw, yeah, there these are two different versions of the same story. So they didn't they they were my research assistants. These people who were trying to uh, to reconcile these. I mean, you know, was Jesus um, robe uh, purple or was it, one, or was it uh, magenta? Well, maybe the sun was shining it, it looked red to this one and somebody reported. I mean, they, they go to great lengths to try to reconcile these apparent contradictions. Um, so I think that we, uh, we live in a pretty free society in that regard, although there are certainly schools where my approach would not be welcome, um, but that's okay. I'm at Berkeley. You know? Uh, we can say what we want here. This is, there's free speech here. We had to fight for it. So um, I would say that I think that we have pretty much uh, freedom of the press and free speech in, in the United States on, a, on all topics, including the Bible. But it's still touchy. And there are still places, there are still, after all, religious universities, which are pretty doctrinaire, which don't allow for this kind of approach. They would, I, I'm sure they'd think I'm very blasphemous to, uh, to do this. But that's okay. Only have, only have one life. Uh, the uh, threats you've gotten, the trouble you've been in, was that for your book on the Quran or? No, other? actually, the, the Quran. I had no. Um, probably nobody's read it. I mean, I'm probably safe. Uh, although one Arab scholar wrote me from Hungary. He said it was, it was a, a terrific book. He said, "I think I'm going to try and see if I can get it translated into Arabic." I'm not sure that's such a good idea. My wife was annoyed that I dedicated it to my grandchildren and hope there'd be greater religious tolerance and understanding. Um, no, the football, the threats I got, death threats, are not so much in the Bible as in my theory of football as homosexual ritual. That got me a lot of death threats. More, that was more dangerous than running about the Bible. Well, that's another story that's uh, very close to the Swiss's heart, whether William Tell is their hero. And again, we have a father-son story where a father is uh, shooting uh, apples off his uh, an apple off the son's head, and again, you should read my essay on the subject before uh, hearing me on it. But it's clear there's a, it's a, has a psychological dimension, which accounts for the appeal of a threat that a father might kill a son. And uh, it's again the the Oedipal story once again. And then people say, well, how can it keep being the Oedipal story? Well, it keeps being the Oedipal story because that's the basic story of our of growing up and uh, boys. Uh, admiring their fathers, but also fearing them, and also being rivals for the attention of the mother. And when daddy's out of town, I get to sleep in mommy's bed, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, the and it's no accident that Freud chose the name Oedipus for this constellation, because he recognized that the folk had already articulated it in the form of a folktale. He didn't call it a folktale. They, they usually call it a myth. It's not a myth. It's a folktale. It's tale type Arna Thompson 931 in the tale type index, standard folktale. In fact, in the oral versions of the tale, it's it's much more explicit. When the uh, boy who's raised by other parents grows up and comes to uh, the town where his real mother is, she hires him to uh, stand guard over her garden or orchard at night. And at night, uh, intruder an intruder enters her orchard presumably to pick apples or something. And he, uh, you know, he's on guard and he shoots the intruder and it turns out to be his father. Well, the fact that a son shoots his father who's an intruder in, 
in his mother's garden at night. I mean, uh, unless you want somebody to draw pictures for you, it's pretty clear. Now, that would have been a better version if Sophocles had thought of using that instead of the version that he did, because Sophocles is basically a literary version of a folktale. Sometimes what people believe is true or believe happened might be as important as what actually happened. This is like folk history being as important as actual history. But why, how could folk history be as important as actual history? Well, folk history is what people believe happened. So people tell stories in their families about family history, and they leave out the horse thief, and they leave out all the negative things, and they uh, present themselves as heroic characters in their own life stories. And even in the case of George Washington, I mean, the most famous story about him is uh, chopping down the cherry tree and confessing to his father. It probably never happened. It doesn't matter. I mean, to the folklorist, it doesn't matter. It matters to the historian. The historian is like, oh, it's an apocryphal story. Parson Weems put it into his hagiographical hey, study of and biography of Washington to make him a greater person. From the folklore's point of view, we don't, we don't care that it didn't happen. The fact that people tell the story, and some probably actually believe that it may have happened, is more important than the actual history, because it tells you something about the father of our country, that he didn't lie. Probably the last time that the president could say that. Um, so uh, that's what I mean when I, that, that what people think happened maybe is as important in terms of understanding them as what actually happened, because we don't always know what, what actually happened. It's important for us to believe that Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin. It's a perfect American success story, rising from humble origins to become president. We still like that story, although occasionally a rich person, a Yale graduate, gets to be president. It wasn't but that's born. not his story. Well, that's not the log cabin story. It reminds me of the story about Richard Nixon being interviewed like I am now by a reporter who says, is it true, Mr. Nixon, that you were born in a log cabin? And Nixon said, no, no, you have me mixed up with Abraham Lincoln. I was born in a manger. <laughs>